we're live, so. <laughs> so, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the last artist talk of the second Roma Biennale with the title, We Are Here, created by Delaila Bass and Anse Bitici, dedicated to the Memorial Day under the motto, Existence. This evening, we are going to discuss about issues such as the demand for um, deep intercommunity solidarity in the era of radical differences and the contest of struggles for social justice, the need for a transversal and intersectional political agenda among resistant and resilient communities, and much more together with the artists Barbia Sante, Emilia Rigova, Daniel Zhao, Jana Kisser and Anime Martin and the young group Birsin here, Edis Galushi, Scott Benesina Bandan, Mara Lehon, and moderated by Simone Frangi, researcher, writer, and curator working at intersection between critical thinking, curatorial research, and pedagogical practice. So good evening at all, everybody. Hi. Good evening. Hi. Hi. Good evening. Hi. Hi. Anna. Hello. 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 <laughs> so, Simone, I will leave you with the. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Luna, for this uh, very generous introduction. And uh, thank you to the Second Roman Biennale for organizing this and inviting me. Such an honor and responsibility to moderate this panel tonight. Um, so I also want to thank all the artists that are participating to this uh, event tonight. And so maybe before going into um, deep discussion and conversation among us, I would ask uh, to Barbie, Emilia, Danyang, Diana, and me, and Yes, in here, Edis, Scott, and Mara, to introduce themselves uh, briefly in order for us and for uh, our audience to understand from where you talk from and uh, which is the core of your practice. Uh, and then we will, so it will be a very short round of introduction and then we will uh, go into the live uh, conversation. So Barbie, maybe I would ask you to start and tell us a little bit more about you. Hi, hello, I'm Barbie and I am speaking from London. I'm speaking from a place where um, my family arrived um, from Ghana after a coup in 1966. They arrived here in 67 and um, my sister and I were born in the 1970s. Um, I, that's a really good place to start for me because I think that's where a lot of my practice starts in the explorations that I do around place and space, thinking about it um, globally and locally as a child of a migrant, and also thinking about the legacies of slavery and colonialism that, um, you know, kind of underpin my arrival. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. We will go deeper into a lot of questions that you raised right now uh, in our conversation tonight. Maybe Emilia, you can take over and tell us a little bit about you. Okay, so I'm from Slovakia and I'm a visual artist. And uh, for a quite long time, I have been dealing in my work with the topic of uh, culture and social stereotypes and politics of the body. My art projects are based on social research and analysis and express their ideas in visual language. Uh, last 10 years, uh, uh, my work uh, deals with the topic of internal and external construction of Romani identity and the appropriation of the Romani body in the long history of European culture. So I uh, deconstruct uh, stereotypical representation used by the majority society. And uh, when I started with this topic in my visual language, I created my alter ego body, Raklori. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Emilia. We will go deeper into also 
questions of identification, identitarian assignation a little bit later in this talk. So I think your contribution will be super important to this topic. I will leave the floor now to Dan Yang so that she can introduce herself a bit. I'm Dan Yang. I'm talking from Berlin. Originally, I'm from China. I have been here in Berlin since almost 13 years. Uh, I'm artist, also curator, and in the last 10 years in Berlin, my artistic activities including creating and creations mostly is related to cultural changing, social issues, politics, and I'm also a human rights activist against the authoritarian China. Yes. Thank you, Danya. Thank you so much. Uh, we will pass the word now to a big group. So Jana, Anemi, and the young group of yes in here so that they can introduce a bit themselves and tell us a little bit more about this collaborative configuration. Okay. So. So um, I will talk for our group. Um, our name is Wiesentier. It means uh, we are here. And we are the group from uh, Roma Trial. And we are peer trainers against uh, anti-Ziganism. And um, we play theater, uh, a special form, form from theater, like a forum theater, where we include the audience to go on the stage and to play um, to play solutions or um, um, yes, to play solutions. And my name is Estera. Um, I'm David. And my name is Naomi. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, and I'm Jana. I'm a photographer and I work on the topics of equality and abuse of power and um, also, I work together with Anemi, who is not with us, but in the Zoom. And um, yeah, we found our way together through a photo workshop. That's where we started uh, to work together as a group. And yeah, so nice to be here with all of you. Thank you. Anemi, maybe you want to add something? Um, yes, I'm Anemi. I'm a photographer too, um, and I'm yeah. My um, issues are at the moment um, uh, climate change and um, also like political issues. I worked on too, um, and I um, work with Jana as an artist do as well. So I do like solo projects and projects with Jana. Yeah. Thank you, Anami. You're also introducing another topic that it's really uh, traveling a lot in your practice, <laughs> which is the ecological question, also how our relationship to climate and to natural, natural world actually, it's a sort of reflex of hegemonic practices that we've been enacting towards different communities. So we will also touch upon this topic, I think also uh, with Scott at a certain point. So I will maybe ask Scott to introduce himself, uh, to tell us a little bit more about yourself and your practice. Obuju, Penisi Dijnikas, Maingan Dodem, Obishko Keng Donji. What I said is, uh, my name is Scott. I'm originally from Obishko Kang or Laksu First Nations in Canada. Um, I'm I'm Skyping or Zooming in from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada right now. And uh, my practice really centers on uh, the politics of language and sort of language reclamation and sound works. Um, and I come to this project through a collaboration, a long-standing collaboration with Delaine Labos. So, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Edis, it's your turn now. <laughs> Greetings to all. I'm Eddie from Kosovo. I work as a teacher, but at the same time, I'm a cultural activist. Uh, my interest is culture, specifically theater. 
Preko lo teatro, ten ti navakajte vás da vare sa počipiakova sveko interesuje romane počipasko. Through theater I try to raise the voice of the Romani interests wherever possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Mara, you can introduce yourself. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Mara, I'm an <clears throat> artist, I'm working mainly with communities. Uh, mostly with fragile communities, um, with people who came, yeah, came a long way <laughs> to arrive in Europe and um, face uh, many difficulties, especially with the health system. Uh, so I've started in the last years to um, to focus on the hidden knowledge of uh, diasporic cultures about healing plants and healing uh, strategies. Um, and also indigenous practices uh, that have been uh, long forgotten uh, about the first um, apothecaries pharmacies of the world, which were naturally rooted. And um, so, um, yeah, my interest came because my grandmother, uh, my great grandmother was fleeing in World War II with four kids and a little hand wagon and she had, um, little handmade apothecary in her wagon out of wooden stuff like a wooden box where she was collecting plants she read randomly found along the way and um, she was creating tinctures and oils out of that to to hear to cure her kids and so yeah um, so i am now working um, on different participatory projects with different communities, mainly women. Right now, also for this phase of the Biennale with a Syrian group of women, uh, Jena, which is in Berlin, at Damweg um, 216. <laughs> and yeah, it's um, like, it's a pleasure to be with you this night. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mara. Uh, so already from this very first round of introduction, we see we have a very, very rich panel tonight with a lot of very important questions that are uh, analyzed and discussed and enacted also in your practice. We see that there is this very important dimension of the community. And as uh, uh, Luna was mentioning, this need for creating intercommunal solidarity, not just uh, solidarity within the community. And also the fact that you understand your practice, your artistic practice and processes as a way of struggle for social justice alongside with other um, constellation of struggle that you uh, involve uh, in your work. Um, we decided to organize this talk through different questions, uh, like a very first question, which is addressed to all the artists and the participants to this panel, and then two more specific questions, which are uh, that actually goes into more details and uh, actually try to raise questions that are uh, inhabiting uh, practices of some of the artists and not uh, others, and then we will close this panel with a collective, uh, another collective answer, which is more about the contribution of your, uh, of your contributions to the Biennale. Um, I also wanted to say that all the questions that I will ask you tonight are deeply related to the uh, statements of the Biennale and the political agenda of the Biennale. So I would say that all these panelists uh, inspired by uh, this, um, this statement and by the first conversation that I could have with Amza and Luna in, in the process of pre preparing uh, this, um, this uh, conversation. So the fir first question that I would like to ask, and it's the question I would like to ask to you all, it's a question which is about the link, the relationship between commemoration and survival, which is at the very core of this Biennale. So uh, also, we all know uh, that for communities that underwent uh, oppressions, uh, organized genocide and violence, especially colonial violence, and for communities whose archives are vulnerable or broken, who are marked by obliteration that by enacted by what Barbie in her statement calls the archival injustice, memorial practices are not just a mere act of glorification, of the past, but instead they represent a, 
especially a side of affirmation of the very fact of existing, of being here, of being still here. And we have a group here which is named by this uh, affirmation. So in our first conversation uh, together with Luna, Amze suggested that there is an hegemonic understanding of public memory, of creating public memory, which is especially active in the white west, uh, and which is about erecting monuments and putting stones. So focusing on stones as elements of uh, memory. And he was stating that Romani memorial practices uh, resemble more to the act of growing flowers at plural, of growing a bunch of flowers uh, in order to keep also this idea of the multiplicity of uh, the Romani experience. And so starting from this uh, very deep suggestion, I would say that we understand that memorial work, it's not just about an act, but it's an ongoing process, ongoing probably forever. And so I would relate this idea to one very important thing that it's written in the description of the event tonight, and I quote, the monument, and we are talking about the monuments to uh, the memorial to Sinti and Roma of Europe murdered uh, by the national socialism. Monuments bears witness to our history, I'm quoting, and stands symbolically for hundreds of thousands of our ancestors whose lives were extinguished. The memorial bears witness of the existence of our ancestors, those also to our present reality, end quote. So I would say that starting from this idea, memory is the law about unforgetting. So opposing to the very action, the organized action of forgetting or make things forgettable. And so memory is the law about making, making people and events less forgettable. So it's not about displaying, it's not about exhibiting, it's not just about glorifying the past. And I would end this reconstruction with another quote, which is taken from the description of the event of tonight. I quote, for many survivors and their descent, the memorial represents a symbolic grave that the victims never had. And for the descendant of the perpetrators, it is a memorial as well, as an expression of responsibility, not only for the injustice committed, but for the observance of human rights in today's Europe, end quote. So I think it's really important also to reconstruct this reciprocity of the memorial and of the creation of, um, of memory, of public memory. So my question for you all, it would be a very general question and very deep uh, question, but it's uh, the following. How does your art practice relate to memorial practices? Is it able, I mean, is it your practice able to propose a compromise between monuments and flowers, this idea of growing flowers and the compromise it with the idea of erecting monuments, putting stones. And my last question would be, does art create memory as a way of projecting through utopias and speculation better future possibility instead of just uh, remembering the past? So um, it's a very wide and maybe two deep set of questions, but I would like you to maybe give a provisional answer. Uh, and so I would follow with the order that we followed before us. So I would start with Barbie also, because she's the one that talks about archival injustice, injustice in her um, statement. And I think it's very telling uh, for this occasion. So Barbie, maybe you can start. Firstly, I, I want to say, I, I don't know why I feel incredible, incredibly emotional in this space with you all. I feel um, in a deep sense of, of um, connection and, and, and grief, but also just a kind of possibility around the ways that we're all working around those things. So um, I'm, really, I'm really thankful to be here and to witness your energy because I feel it as energy. Um, and thank you for that question, because um, memory is my, uh, is definitely something that I've been working with a lot. I, um, in my proposition around an archival injustice, um, I've been really thinking through a possibility that um, of a principle called Sankofa or Sankofa, which is uh, an Akan 
um, principle, principle or kind of um, sort of a, a way of, of, of imagining or thinking um, through death rites. So Akan is from Ghana. It's from um, the kind of Twi Fanti, Ashanti speaking people. And um, the Sankofa is represented by a bird who is looking back to uh, an egg that is on their back. And Sankofa or Sankofa means basically to go back and get it, to go back and retrieve. And I've also been really thinking within my practice about not just going back and getting it, but going back to, about the egg on the back of that. What does that mean? What is that egg? What is the possibility that memory has to offer to, to, to an egg, which is a, a growth, the possibility of, of, of containing something that is new. Um, and so through my work, I'm kind of not really interested in the kind of, when I'm thinking about the, the archive, I'm interested in the archives that live in the streets and through records and through our bodies and through the ways in which we kind of navigate and the words that we use and the, the prayers. I, I, I make reference a lot to my grandmother who lived for a hundred and uh, till 102. And she um, said a prayer every day, listing the names of all her her grandchildren and um, their children and even if they passed it's kind of makes resonances for me with the idea of um, from Black Lives Matter of actually saying people's names actually speaking people's names and remembering them even as you might not see them or 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 do that so um, in my work recently I've been thinking about how I've been doing a lot of work around um, embodiment and and, and reenactment. Um, so one major project of mine is uh, is really thinking through um, kind of women uh, and their relationship to independence and to, to kind of independence movements, you know, kind of post uh, post colonial decolonial practices. Um, and so that's been enacted through kind of um, uh, an, an imaginary character, well, a, a real but imaginary character, which I reenact. Um, and the, the other project that has been I've been really concentrating on is actually working with collectives of of, of, of black and women of color to um, to work together to to make collective de declarations. These performances that are called declarations of independence, which are not actually declarations of independence, they're actually declarations of our inter interdependence and how much we need each other and how much we need to, to kind of we can draw on our memories and our shared resources to to kind of support our way through some of the things that are happening um, and, and and trouble us um, as we try to navigate our way through our different contexts and this work has been produced in various different places so and and across various different um, uh, you know, kind of timelines. Uh, so for me, memory is, um, is uh, not just uh, for our, you know, for our remembrance and for our commemoration. It is also for the way in which we, uh, we, we can sort of regenerate and generate ourselves. Um, so yeah, that's what I think I want to offer because I know there's a lot of us. <laughs> Thank you, Barbie. I think you pointed out a very important question. First of all, Lydia, the archives are not just institutional places, but you're really looking into this first archive. And I think that this is pretty much important when we look at bodily archives, such as also Emilia is doing in her practice. And I also think that there is a, a link uh, between your practices when you talk about uh, fictional characters, uh, art as a space of population, not only about the past, but also for the present and for the futures. So I would ask maybe Emilia to, uh, to expand maybe on this idea. How do you conceive memory? Is it your practice about uh, memorial construction or how do you understand this uh, issue or this need? Uh, maybe I will be quickly than Barbie because of my English, but uh, a part of my artistic uh, program is dedicated to Roma Holocaust. And I started it in 2014 with a series uh, of one minute 
performance in the public space, mainly in the forest around Auschwitz, Poland and labor camps in which Roma people suffered and died. Uh, but I think we need something more than annual meetings at memorial place with flowers and wreaths. What we really need is to raise awareness of our ancestors' experience with oppression, and not only during the Second World War in the majority. Because many are and were how the Roma people were actually persecuted in the past. For example, that they were considered slaves in Romania. The com but the contemporary uh, Roma artists work with history and bring their testimony to the white cube. And so, yes, I think art is creating a new collective memory and the current generation of authors is doing something for the next generation. We did not have uh, proper knowledge at the first, but we are learning and we will pass this knowledge on. This was I missed when I was a child, you know? I no, I didn't know have any idea about my culture. So about my history, about Roma history, because of my because my parents uh, were assimilated. Mm -hmm. So they are stopping using their mother language. It's it's difficult, but I believe that our generation will create new or collecting new memories about us. Um, thank you, Mina. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you are pointing out also another uh, very urgent question, which is uh, going around pretty much in your practice uh, of all of you, this idea of creating uh, counter narratives uh, actually that are able to um, in a way counter ritualize certain identifications but also to compensate this loss of memory which is uh, as you were saying there is a link missing link between um, generations that up that have been interrupted also uh, institutionally with uh, uh, with violence so I think it's also something that Dan Young is looking at, uh, while looking at uh, uh, censorship, for example. And Dan Young, you're working a lot into the digital uh, realm. So I would also like to ask you, how do you navigate into this uh, dematerialized uh, dimension? Is it, uh, uh, how do you understand uh, digital platform uh, as a way to recreate memory, to reconnect or to, um, counteract censorship? Uh, for me, I, I won't say I'm specialized about digital platform, uh, but I do work a lot about memories because um, ethnically I'm not part of uh, Roma, but I do share the feeling of live with um, collective trauma uh, because you can understand it's well known in China, also a lot of histories not really allowed to talk about and a lot of die sacrifice and personal traumas and the charities and uh, dies, hating, killing in our history. This really bring me to the event and to what talking about here. And personally, I would like to see, um, it's quite my topic about healing because I have the personal experiences come to Europe. For me, it's uh, 13 years living in Berlin. For me, it's a long term of healing from the authoritarian politics. Because for me, it's a long process of learning democracy and not only learn the rules of it, the, con the definition of it, the concept of it, because I knew it before I came here, but to feel it, to be part of it, 
flew with it. And it make me understand that healing is a thing will never happen when you are alone. Healing, healing is a thing. You find the group, you find the people, you live with people who share this trauma with you. Even your experiences is individual, but you still, you share it with people who carry something similar and uh, you understand them and you observe how they heal themselves, how they are looking for the solution, how they are trying to get out of it and how they handing to the hope. This is a thing, this is a view, give you hope, give you um, perspective, give you the understanding what would happen. Uh, for me, um, it's very interesting because I have friends uh, culturally, socially, or ethnically related to, to Roman. And I always ask them, what make you feel that this is you? Because you are from different countries and you are from different regions. You speak even different languages. You have different faces. How do you know you share this collective memory? How do you know you share this history of you? And their answers always impress me. And uh, because there will be various like family, culture, and uh, also sometimes some personal stories, even smells, even uh, childhood memories or sentiment. Uh, and make me have this feeling, actually, it's not about history. It's, I mean, it's not about a history of any specific ethnic, it's about what do you believe? What are you looking for? What do you feel? What do you want to keep in your memory? What do you want to believe about yourself? Uh, I made two drawings for as my contribution because uh, I was an illustrator when I was in China, but I quit this job for many years. And I pick up my drawing as my contribution, but not the other form because uh, it's very um, authentic for me. And it's really related to my personal memory. And one of them, this, uh, because it's interesting, I want to see um, why I was in China and uh, we have very, very close time. At that time, um, we had very few movies from outside of China. They're just very few, it's like, I can comb them with my hands, like no more than 10. And if in them, we have some stories about gypsy, it's always something wonderful for us. If there are some stories, some parts, some figures, some senses about gypsy, it's always make the movie mm, remarkable, unforgettable, unforgettable. And if you talk, to the liberalist in China from 80s or 90s when they spend their teenager time, they always have this very, very deep memory about the word gypsy. If you talk about the gypsy in Europe, probably you will relate it to some very negative images. But you talk about the word gypsy uh, in China to the liberalist, we will always let you know this is a word related to our memory about freedom, art, uh, romantic ap applications, and uh, adventures, and a trip without knowing where we are heading to, and uh, a risk of uh, being somewhere unknown, but also the pleasure and the hope of being somewhere will always surprise us, always find something new in our lives, and always find something um, like another way to live our lives. Also nowadays, even we have so many, so many uh, informations and cultural products from outside of China, but still, gypsy 
it means something special. It means for us, it's something out of the capitalism. Actually, you know, we have strong capitalism in China now. Everyone work and live for money, for the mechanism of making money. But if you talk about gypsy, it still reminds me and reminds all of us of a way we don't live for money, but we live for a way, a, li a lifestyle, a special lifestyle. Uh, a way of freedom, a way of ad adventure. And uh, talking about this, I just uh, want to share this special and different memory because I want the others known. Uh, the word, a word can mean something really different according to where they are, according to the context, according to the surrounding. So I will say, I feel very grateful that we have gypsy, this world, and uh, people living in their way in the world, because even in a way you will never expect, it brings hope, it brings beauty, it brings imagination for a group of people, a large group of population, locked, isolated in a land, there do not have freedom. Thank you, Daniel. Well, maybe we will go back maybe to a lot of points that you raised in your introduction later. I think uh, there is something very important that you also raised uh, in your intervention, which is this collaborative dimension of the construction of memory, which is not just inside a community or within a community, but it's transversal. I think this relate a lot with what also Emilia uh, were saying uh, about the intergenerational transmission. Uh, and this is why I'm maybe asking to the young group of us in here and uh, Jana and Hanami, maybe to intervene on this topic on how um, memory is constructed not only in a horizontal perspective, but also in this transversal perspective and this idea of creating um, kind of solidarity uh, in a genealogical sense, like really creating forms of transmissions uh, of vertical transmission and not just horizontal transmission. So I would just try to understand how you collaborated on this, uh, on this project and how actually, if this can relate to a form of creation of memory also related to educational practices or participatory practices. So, okay, sorry. Um, so is this the second question that you asked right now? No, maybe we can talk about this later, <laughs> but, uh, which, is, which, is more about, uh, which is more about how you work together. But maybe just to let us know if you, how you worked and if, how uh, yes. you collaborated in this idea of uh, reciprocity that we were evoking at the beginning. So, and how this idea of memory, uh, if this idea of memory is involved in your collaborative process okay so you guys said you would like to show our poster that we did together so we will show it uh, physical so yeah. it's coming Ta -da! <laughs> oh, so I will explain um, what we did. So we um, photo we did a photo workshop together, and um, we went to the memorial in Berlin and we photographed the trees. So on the topic of existence, it was um, important for us to to portray the trees that are in danger because the memorial is in danger as we all know, I think, um, due to uh, planned construction of a uh, train line. So, and the other one? Yes. This is the second one. Oops. So we 
we all had analog cameras and we took our time and photographed all together um, the trees at the memorial. And um, maybe you want to say something, you can say it in German, uh, about the, the day we took the pictures or about how it was for you. Uh, first of all, it was very, very, very good. It, um, may, we had fun to make photos of, uh, of our trees, but uh, it was also in the same moment a bit um, sad because we do um, the photos of our, mm -hmm. uh, of our memorial trees because they are in danger. And then we had to, th to think about uh, that uh, it's something something bad and uh, it will happen uh, something bad like that. <laughs> and uh, yes, but um, we like to do photos and we do it because we know the, we know how important it, it is to show that um, our memorial is in danger. And um, yes, Somebody else want to say something? Ich kann auch auf Deutsch sagen. Ja? Yeah. Okay. Ja. Ja, auf jeden Fall, also ich habe mich äh, beim Anfang äh, den Workshops äh, sehr gut gefühlt. Wir haben äh, über äh, Geschichte so geredet von Fotografie und so mit euch und haben uns ein paar Bilder angeguckt und das, äh, das war so richtig interessant und so. Okay, I translate. So in the beginning, he felt very good about the workshop and we also talk a bit about photo history and show some pictures and wir haben dann äh, von uns Bilder gemacht und äh, das war auch äh, sehr lustig und äh, we took pictures ja. of one another i mean portraits and it was also very funny äh, und dann äh, haben wir ja wie verabredet sind wir zum äh, Denkmal gelaufen und and then we went to the memorial together und äh, als wir irgendwie, also als ich reingegangen bin in den, also in den Denkmal, habe ich so ein äh, Gefühl gehabt irgendwie. Ich dachte, ich, ich habe mir so gesagt, jetzt werde ich die vielleicht zum letzten Mal ein Bild von dem, von dem Bäume machen. Und da hatte ich so ein trauriges Gefühl, so eine, so, ja. So when we when he entered the, the memorial with us, he, he felt sad because he thought maybe it's the last time that he will take a photograph of the trees there. Yes. And I remember it took some time for you, like mm. you were just waiting and sitting before you started yes. taking photos. Yeah, yes. we all was very um, ruhig. Silent, silent, yes, quiet. Silent, quiet, and we we know that it is very important for us, and the Roma also, and um, yes, it was very sad. Yeah. Ja, und für unsere Generation ist das sehr wichtig und auch also dass wir erstmal lernen mit unserem Denkmal umzugehen und das wertzuschätzen. He says for for their generation it's very important to. Um, was hast du gesagt? Äh, zum Sorry. Was ich denk du? mal zu. Also anzunehmen und also. Ach, dass wir das besser annehmen können. Ja. Also, to get to know the memorial to. Ja, to ja, ja. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Ja. Und dann weiterzugeben. And das ist to so um, pass on the knowledge and the, the history and and also the memorial ja. and the memory. Right? Und wir sind also bewusst, dass das unsere Aufgabe ist, auch zu schützen in der nächsten Zeit. So they are aware that it's also it is also their um, task or their will to protect the memorial. Thank you. I think this uh, this is a very touching and strong affirmation that maybe answers also to. Uh, what Amelia was saying, was saying uh, before, but I think it's a law also, this idea of preserving memory, of fighting against loss of memory once it is constructed. It also at the core of Edis practice and especially all the work that Edis does 
around language, for example, and how you use your practice to compensate, let's say like this, to run against uh, this dimension of loss. Also knowing that this memorial is the result of struggles, uh, uh, further struggle that actually uh, Romanian population did in order to memorize in the public arena uh, the genocide. So I would ask Eddie, for example, to intervene and to make us understand how you also work in Kosovo, which is a, um, another location and uh, that has uh, a systemic, uh, let's say, um, understanding of memory, which is it's a huge question also in your territory. So maybe if you can pick uh, and start from what uh, Viazim here just said and trying to elaborate in your own. Uh, of course, um, I can definitely relate to the emotions that were transferred from the old, younger generation. And that's actually what's my aim. Somehow uh, this commemoration and bringing back the history and maybe giving this sense of belonging has been missing for so many years now in Kosovo. And especially we as a country are trying to create a new reality and uh, with a super young country, post-conflict country, uh, we are definitely having so many issues in sense of clarifying uh, the sense of belonging, the, the common uh, sense of uh, contr contributing in building something bigger. Because now also, I mean, Kosovo Roma have, of course, they're doing their part in bringing uh, the, how can I say, it, the pillars of the country in front. And therefore, in this state, uh, especially the younger generation has been lost in the sense of commemorating of what and how the contribution of the Roma has been put in order to put these stronger pillars in the world slash Europe in order to maintain the existence of the Roma, right? And that's when uh, my contribution came uh, into place because I do have two aspects that I focus it's this sense of belonging to bring it back to the Romani youth and especially the second one with the aspect of language. I'm trying to make, because somehow in modern age, Romani language has been endangered, like has been put into the list of endangered languages, which unfortunately uh, it's not about any physical oppression but it's about this modern oppression, which youngsters don't feel any more like in, or they don't feel somehow modern if they were to speak Romani. So with this modernism, I try to sort of fight this modernism and bring back the collective memory in order to um, tell, first of all, to the youngsters of what our community, our nation has gone through in order to maintain all this sense of belonging. And with this modern age, we should just stop and not forget what has been done and what contribution has been given in order to maintain this joint sense of building something stronger in the place wherever we live. So of course, it was like a super great new idea, this fact of uh, victimization of the Roma, especially in the Second World War. And that's when I started writing my um, single act play, which is actually entitled the 2nd of August 1944, where I tried to just highlight some things that happened to the Romani in order to, to bring this collective memory back. And of course, I brought this collective memory back with uh, kind of st standardized Romani in order to just put into stage also to the art artistic uh, platform how powerful Romani language can be when you talk about the Romani and how uh, rich is the language that we have uh, and that should be used in order to raise the awareness of the youngsters that they should definitely uh, keep this memory, fight whatever oppression there is with their own, uh, how can I say, with their own uh, capacities of identities, which are within the community, in this sense, language as well. Thank you very much, Edis. I think I, I'm very happy that you brought up the role of modernity in the construction of all this system of oppression. And I think it's colonial modernity is also, uh, let's name things, uh, also colonial modernity, it's a, 
about uh, yeah the construction and the assignations of uh, certain communities to certain roles and as you were saying maybe victimization has been uh, a nice invention and then we need now maybe to pass through a more affirmative and more constructive approach to this construction of memory so maybe working on this area of colonial modernity i would uh, transfer the same question that i asked you to also to scott uh, and maybe Scott, maybe also to understand how you relate to this idea, how to uh, fight against what colonial modernity has put in place and which kind of um, memorial approach you have in order to compensate this long and systemic uh, work of oppression that has been put in place. Yeah, thank you for that question. And thanks for your responses there. They're very thought provoking. Um, I think I want to start by just saying that uh, the act of like the, the modernity you're talking about is that we just um, in Canada, there's this ongoing uh, discovery of the past, the colonial past that keeps getting brought up. So in the last year, they've discovered over a couple thousand unmarked graves around the residential schools. And so there's this ongoing sense of trauma and history that gets brought up. And so I find myself off, oftentimes hard pressed to find a strategy to deal with that because every day they find new new mass graves for these children from the residential school. And I think <clears throat> monument making during those times is very, very difficult, you know. Um, but in that effect, I think uh, the, the, the collaboration I do, I do with people around the world, including Delane, is that those relationships, those ephemeral relationships uh, through language and through art making are the things that can't uh, can't be broken, right? Those are the things that strengthen us. And so if we bake, if we build something from rock that they can be taken by the colonial state. If you sing a song or tell a story, those things can never be taken. And I think in my practice, uh, I use the language a lot because the, the, the sound of the language, the land hears that, you know, it, the, the sound resonates in the land and the land he remembers these languages and Anishinaabemowin and uh, it makes the land happy. And if the land's happy, it accepts us. And that is the best monument, that relationship. So I think, um, that personal relationship is the ultimate monument for myself. And I think um, being included in this sort of work with Elaine and the ongoing sort of collaboration, I think those personal relationships are what I really focus on in terms of um, what the art is trying to make and sort of strengthen. So, um, Super. Uh, yes, I'm really, I'm really marked by what you said about a poem or a song that cannot be taken by the colonial state. And also certain kind of knowledges that have not been uh, put into the discipline or uh, organized can also escape this kind of uh, um, colonial mindset and uh, appropriation. So it's about actually this thing of the living that escapes um, colonial uh, organization of life that I would also, would also ask to Mara to tell us a little bit about this um, fluid knowledge on which she is working on in her practice. Uh, you, you've been talking a lot about healing and also about uh, certain practices that, that overcome and escape medicalization, for example. So I would maybe ask you how you relate this work that you do uh, about healing with the question of memory. Okay, yeah. Uh, so for me, <clears throat> as you said in the beginning, um, making something not forgettable. I think um, in my work, it's much about a memorial as a ground of of caring, of awareness, and um, by that also creating a counter narrative. Um, we did in, um, in May this year um, with Elaine, with whom I also uh, founded Nomadic Seeds uh, during COVID, which is also part of the BNL. We um, invited an activist group from uh, Bogota, uh, which is um, defending um, indigenous collectives and in this time um, the protest started in Colombia or had already been for one month and people were killed by the police by this regime and um, had to face not just that the, their land was taken but also their voice and their lives were taken 
And so um, I invited this collective and also um, there was an idea to give a, a ground for people to speak in Europe because the media was 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 um, uh, not letting through the real or the facts that were happening there because all the media in Europe was just dominated by COVID, COVID, COVID headlines. And, um, but there was such that, that this, um, yeah, violence against, huma against humanity was taking place. Nobody was talking about this. So, um, and in the other, in the other way, um, <clears throat> originally the colonial European regime um, is itself responsible for what is happening in Colombia because we indirectly support and foster the regime there. So it was important to reach the perpetrators uh, the, of the colonial perpetrators in Europe and to create awareness about what is happening um, through a kind of protest that was not... Um, yeah, not um, putting in 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 um, in problems those people who were opening up about themselves what it was really happening about the protest. So we tried to create a common space where people were able to speak, and we were naming also um, the names of the people who had died already in the, during the protests, responding to that with an action that was called a planting protest. By planting awareness, like every, every European person was invited to plant life <laughs> on the balcony into one's garden as a kind of community online performance to also plant awareness about colonial violence inside of your home, because just what you see directly next to you, you really keep in mind. So there was one action we were doing, and it was also uh, accompanied by a very beautiful action that was called um, Plans for Protest. Um, a manifesto was written uh, together with a group of farmers' kids in, in Bogota, which were are living in at the, um, on an old um, ancestral settlement, uh, which was which was became nearly extinct by colonial invaders from Europe, and they were writing about the power of plants, plants as protesters, like what we can learn from them, like for example um, from calendula, or. Um, yeah, uh, I, I have it here, <laughs> dandelion and dandelion. And so plants that resist against what is happening and have itself also properties of healing. So that was one action. And what I do now uh, is with a group of Syrian women in, in Berlin in a community garden. Also, I tried to, we try to make a memorial by creating a ground where experiences can be shared and be, can openly be expressed without judge and without, like, I think the most problematic thing is that people who arrive here in a forced, as a forced migration, with a forced migration cannot express their cultural life and their, their, um, their, their feelings and their, their bisogni um, um, in, in, in Italiano, <laughs> their needs anymore. <laughs> so they cannot express their needs anymore without being judged or without put, put, being put into a category. And this is very important there that we, we work um, on with, with storytelling, we work with somatic expression of the body to express what has happened, to express what, what has ha happened in this case in Syria under the regime of Assad. And uh, on the other way, uh, trying to focus on the question, what do I need to heal? Like what do the women need to heal for themselves to cure their ache 
and to to feel better and to 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 save their identity that was stolen. So and this is leading into into discussions, into dialogues, and then also into the construction, common construction of a healing garden with healing plants, of course. But more, the the process is more that that this really that has started by themselves and not by me, but no, in a, in a really um, from the inside, away from the inside, that is expelling out and forming the shape of of the visual expression of it. Then, so yeah, and I think this is very important to give the voice to those people uh, who really, really need a memorial, and not just for those who are dead, but also for those who are still alive and. And that they can create a constructive ground for themselves to live on and to create something constructive. So, yeah. Thank you, Mara. And also, I think we are slowly unpacking this idea, like not slowly, like really also very openly unpacking this idea that memory is about life and living people. It's not just about uh, remembering a past, which is uh, important to remember, but so I would maybe use your intervention as a transition because you touch upon a lot of topics that have also been brought up by um, Dan Young before, and and I would maybe transit to another uh, question, which is a question about trauma. Uh, also, this traumatic experience has been uh, evoked by a lot of you, and uh, we cannot deny that memorial work, this work of constructing memory of uh, re-memory of making things less forgettable uh, is hunted by uh, collective and personal traumas, especially for those communities that have been um, that have suffered actually from uh, oppression. And so my question would be uh, to maybe starting with uh, uh, with Barbie uh, is the question about the dangers of re-traumatization uh, in this memorial work, because I understand that also in your practice, Barbie, you talk a lot about healing uh, and you construct your projects as spaces of healing, but also a lot of you, we, we um, talk about unlearning, like constructing the art practice as spaces of unlearning, the art practice as spaces of education, of re-education. And so my question um, would be, which kind of strategies do you employ in your artistic practice in order to avoid uh, re-traumatization in thinking about heavy events in the past? And um, is artistic practice conceived as a space of healing, of mutual re-education? Does art practice can compensate certain violence who can maybe reparate, create a form of reparation of intersected violence. So my question would be uh, really about which are the, uh, the danger at stake in this process of uh, healing. Uh, I think you answered in a way, uh, in a lot of your answers, but maybe we can focus a little bit more on that. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, <clears throat> ooh, London, London police trauma. Um, the idea of healing within my work is really about uh, create, creating a space for witness, to be witnessed, to be um, heard, um, to, to speak um, and to be resourced. And I think, um, I mean, I have taken on like certain kinds of training um, uh, in healing for my for myself that that I feel is really important to learn in in order to to kind of hold space and you know kind of also thinking about how I kind of work with other healers like because there's something you said as well because I think if I was in Ghana <laughs> if Ghana hadn't been totally affected if Africa had not been so totally affected by the, the ravaged um, you know coloniality which continues today um, and continues today even in our in our presence in the in, in Europe and the Americas as well the, the, the effects of that um, I, I 
I don't know whether we would be able to describe myself as an artist, the things that I do. It's just that art is a space that I found in which I can, I can um, express a certain kind of, uh, I could give a certain kind of expression and I can use the tools to kind of navigate getting into spaces and using spaces and utilizing spaces really for our benefit. So for example, with Declaration of Independence, we do present this work within, or I have presented this work within contemporary art contexts, contemporary you know, um, biennales and, 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 uh, and art spaces. But it's really important for me to kind of uh, use my uh, influence as, as um, being known as the artist to make an invitation to people to be able to kind of have use this space for an experience. So for example, recently I did a, a performance in a, a, a space um, in Cambridge um, with a shaman and um, four other artists, four, four, yeah, four other artists and a musician. And uh, one of the things that I have in this space is a lot of um, modernist artistic pieces that you know, obviously draw on a lot of African culture. Um, and they're, they're just around this is in this in this house, they're kind of been collected. And the experience of actually kind of bringing um, the the kind of the piece that we did was almost as well, like a, a kind of a catharsis and a, and a reclamation of a sort of energy that, you know, kind of belonged to us belong to um, uh, you know, uh, us through this kind of process of of, um, of creating this this con this space, which is the art world. I mean, we mustn't forget how this kind of comes about through the the I suppose it through, through looting and and a supposed collection of curiosity, um, and you know, um, and that has meant that a lot of our cultures have lost um, very important. Um, ancestral and, uh, and and ritual items through these this process of collecting. So then how, how then do we as artists kind of respond to these spaces? Um, I, sometimes I think that one of the things that I would say more is more traumatic is um, is how that work is received or how we work with curators or how we work with with people who don't necessarily, um, who, who kind of make the invitation on the fact that, you know, everybody's like getting woke now and everybody's like thinking about climate change and different cultures and different experiences and decolonizing everything and whatever, but they still don't have the capacity to be able to hold our work and our, pro our presences. And um, that takes a lot as I think, as an artist to be able to know that you need to, uh, take care of yourself as well as taking care of those people that you're working with um you know what audrey lord said is really important you know that that our self-care is part of our our warfare you know um so um those are the, that's the kind of strategy that i'm i'm kind of thinking about is like how do we get into this but also to be in those spaces but not of them I don't think it's important to, to be an, an artist and want to, you know, claim all of that that stuff. It's just like to be in it, to use it, to tr to trespass, to interrupt, to to kind of to mess with their to mess with their heads, to like fuck it up, to blow it up, you know. Um, and that that kind of really goes back to the idea that the that the the actual art and the art space is an archive in itself. So it is already contains a whole lot of injustice within it. And so how do we then undo that? Thank you, Barry. Thank you also for pointing out this very important difference between the rhetoric of art and the use of art, the real work uh, in, in art and through art. So I also think that you said something very important that we work in a moment of expropriation of health uh, that has been very uh, heavy also over the past two years. So I think what you said about mental health, physical health is really, really important. And I would uh, like to ask the same question also to Scott, because Scott, in your 
first intervention, you talked a lot about uh, talking to the earth, uh, talking with the earth. So I would maybe ask you to respond to this idea of healing and uh, of the ambiguity also of the artistic practice in relation to that and how you put yourself in relationship to these various interlocutors that you have in your uh, practice. Sure. Um, I think uh, when it comes to trauma, I think I think you said something about self-care is warfare or it was it was a beautiful little quote, though. Um, I think for me, it's just being hyper aware of what I can make art about, like where, where along that process is and don't force it, like just because it's a deadline, just because it's a show. So not all, everything can be part of the art making process yet. So I think just knowing what's available to uh, and accessible internally and emotionally and how to uh, how to make art around that that feels good and not exploitative. And I think for me, being connected to the community and uh, working with the elders and thinking through stories and listening to the stories is that all these part process of healing is sort of self self takes care of itself, you know? So I think ethically just being really centered in the community and on the land, I think is the strategy I use most often to make sure that I don't end up in a cycle of trauma and sort of despair. Bit, so. Thank you. I would maybe now ask to, uh, Hanami and Yana, and to Vyazin here, how you navigate in your project this workshop space, because your contribution comes out of a, uh, let's say, this educational format or collaborative format. So I would ask you maybe to uh, um, talk a little bit about uh, this collaborative space and if this collaborative space has really been a space of mutual unlearning or uh mutual uh, healing in the process that you enacted for the collaboration of this uh, for this biennale how you use actually this format and how you operated in it we can't hear you anymore Yana. Uh, maybe you're doing the translation yes yeah, sorry, one moment, I have to, we have to speak about it. Maybe Anami, if you want to start. Yeah, to maybe something. I can say um, a few things. I think, um, first of all, it's more, mm, more collaborative. It was more a collaborative thing than an educational thing. Um, because... Um, I think there were no like hierarchies or something. For me, it was really, I was learning from them and I um, wasn't teaching something or um, yes, I'm just coming from, um, from a photography focus, from a photographic perspective. Um, and it was also important for us like to, um, do it in an analog and really like to um, to to feel the the pictures and to um, um, yeah that it's just a, a process to take these pictures and not to see them um, like a, I wouldn't say meditation but um, Yeah, and maybe that was <laughs> not really the question. Um, sorry, I lost my... Maybe we have uh, an answer. Okay. From... Yeah, yeah. We, can, we can continue here. <laughs> yeah, also ich kann anfangen. I will translate again. Yes. Uh, und zwar, um, es war uh, am Anfang uh, hatten wir so ein Gefühl, okay, wir machen jetzt Bilder und ja, das wird schon, das sind ja Bilder zu machen, äh, aber wir sind so in ein Gespräch schon reingegangen und haben eigentlich so gedacht, was bedeutet es eigentlich, dass wir uns diese Bilder zu machen äh, und haben darüber geredet und äh, waren so begeistert dann Bilder zu machen und haben nicht mehr aufgehört, Bilder zu machen. Und wir sind zum Beispiel bei einem Denkmal gegangen und haben über 100 Bilder gemacht 
Und dann haben wir die alle zusammen, äh, wie gesagt, äh, aus der Welt. Und äh, ja, das war ein richtig schöner Prozess, äh, de, diese Kombination zwischen Spaß, aber auch was dazu zu lernen. Ich glaube, das ist das Wichtigste, was man so äh, in eine, ja, also wenn man irgendwas lernen muss, so, das ist die beste Kombination, wie man das lernen kann, mit Spaß und Lernen. Über. Okay, so oh, I try to get this together. He said that um, it was nice to learn something, but also have fun at the same time. And um, that he had so much fun taking photographs and um, you didn't expect it before that it would be so much fun. And, and it was a, a lot of... Am Anfang hast du, am Anfang dachtest du einfach, ja, wir machen Bilder und so mal gucken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he didn't expect in the, yeah. in the beginning that it would be so yeah. much fun. And uh, so we took, yeah, he said we took like more than 100 photographs in at the memorial. And then we, together, we selected our favorites and um, built the poster. Yes. Aber was ganz wichtig ist, diese Kombination zwischen Lernen und also Spaß haben. Das But ist very important for him is the combination of learning and having fun at the same time. Yes. And it was very nice to see that we don't had uh, someone uh, like, oh my God, I have to follow this, uh, this person and uh, she will tell me what, what to do. We do things what we wanted and we do like... Uh, yes how we feel to do it and we don't um, we don't have like uh, oh my god she is the boss and we have to follow her we was very free and it was very nice and it was also like uh, anime says that we learn something about each other together we learn uh, from them that how we can uh, make photos and how it is to make photos and it was very nice and they uh, learn from us how it is to like how it is to work with us or to uh, new new kids and uh, yes it was like win win situation yes <laughs> very uh, nice exchange and also i i feel the same that i i can learn from you a lot and i'm very thankful for our We are collaboration you. <laughs> thank you very much one of the one of the topic of this biennale is also the question of self confession and self empowerment that i think it's pretty much related to uh, your last intervention also this idea of uh, breaking a bit expectations and being surprised how uh, certain spaces, also kind of collaborative spaces can uh, in a way uh, produce tools of, uh, on a way giving an account of yourself or oneself, but also in a way giving tools for uh, self-empowerment. And I have a, a very last question that maybe can help us also to transit towards the conclusion of this uh super rich uh, conversation and it's actually uh one thing that also um, um we were evoking at the beginning so the uh, also Alice, you were talking about self, a sense of belonging so i think there is an interesting um discussion to have about uh, practices of identification self-identification and also imposed practices or processes of assignation so my um, question would be more uh, about the role of art in this uh, and the effectiveness of art in uh, breaking this uh, system of assignation and producing, facilitating more practices of identification. And also my practice, uh, my question would be more, if you understand art as a form of visual or symbolic activism, so the idea between your visual practice and symbolic practice and activism, I really appreciated uh, Barbie saying that a lot of, uh, uh, when you said decolonize everything and uh, there is a lot of rhetoric and strategic wording in the artwork right now. So I would ask you maybe to 
um, answer to this is really art able to produce activist form and how do you think that your practice uh, is doing this so maybe I would start with um, with Edis because you uh, introduce this idea of sense of belonging, of creating new of sense course. of belonging. Of course, I think arts is a great educational tool that can actually bring uh, into stage many uh, sort of questions that haven't been put into table. And in that in that sense, it tries it tries to educate its audience, no matter what type of or what genre of arts. So I definitely see the role of arts of being an educational tool that can evoke uh, anger, that can evoke uh, trauma, but still in the sense of educating and, and maybe speaking into a level that sometimes cannot be spoken, or maybe bringing forward questions that sometimes can be put forward. So therefore, I see I see that the role of art is definitely crucial, and that's how I use in my uh, work in sometimes maybe directly, but sometimes indirectly speaking and raising consciousness and awareness about things that we as community and also society want. So I definitely see the role of art as an educational tool. Thank you. Thank you, Edis. I would maybe pass the word to... Um, um, to Emilia, because you said something very important uh, before you openly speak about your practice uh, as a way of eradicating certain prejudices that are uh, assigned to um, Romani women, especially. So maybe I would really uh, ask you to also talking about this uh, beautiful poster you did for the Biennale and maybe uh, tell us a little bit how uh, your work uh, contribute to this uh, dissolution of certain prejudice, certain simple, simple identities that have been constructed about uh, Romani women? Mm. Of course, I see art as a form of visual activism, especially in the contemporary authors. But by coming out as a Roma, they risk getting labeled as a Roma artist. In a sense, it excluded them from the artistic mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, but our society needs a generation of visible, active artists who are willing to risk being labeled so that the next generation will have source to draw from. They will have Roma names an experience, they will have someone to look up to the way we didn't. In the last century, uh, I think uh, no Roman name uh, resonated in a visual art, but our generation is witness to a historical change. Uh, for example, Malgojata Mirgatas will be forever be the first Roma woman to present Poland at the Venice Biennale as her home country next year. And there are many examples across Europe and even more across different media in art. It is very important. We are living in authentic imprint here for the next generation. And I really see this is a historical breakthrough like mm, the 200 years of African-American art exhibition in the 1917 in the USA was the breakthrough for the black people. We authors with the Roma roots are experiencing it now. And I think contemporary Roma art is more than uh, topical as a it has been developing rapidly and in a variety of ways during the last two decades. It indicates that we are witnessing a major, major change. There is an opportunity to understand the Roma art, Roma art in a new context and observe a shift from the ethnographic approach 
toward the reflection of this issue from the viewpoint of art history. So I think we are making the big things now, our generation, for next generation. Super. Thank you so much also for this very, uh, let's say, affirmative opening towards the future. I think you said very crucial things also about this constant generation of uh, labels and also the necessity of getting rid of this ethnographic look on uh, artists, uh, understanding them only from their um, supposed origin or uh, sense of belonging. Uh, I would maybe ask to Dan Yang to contribute on this. We are going towards the end of our uh, conversation, but Dan Yang, you, um, my question to you would be, if you think that art can give a valuable contribution to the struggle for human rights, you talk about this uh, and you talked about this also in your previous contribution. So maybe we can leave you the last word on this and uh, then I will pass the word to Luna uh, for the conclusion. So maybe if you talk, if you can say something about this, uh, this idea. Yeah, sure. Uh, your question is um, if art could contribute to human rights struggling. I would like to see uh, my activity. I always combine my human, human rights activities and uh, my art projects together. Uh, because for me, it's, yes, we are struggling with uh, discrimination, uh, the misuse of power, the abuse, mm, the, the deep evil and the corruptions and everything actually harmful, evil, meaningful, in humanity, in human nature, in every of us. And uh, in art, I think the most uh, significant part of it, not to make the statement of justice, not to see, to tell people what is right, uh, not to see we are, uh, we are the good guys. This is not what art would do. The thing, art can do more than others, more than this uh, demonstration on the street or any other direct human rights activist is art can invite everyone, all the, every audience into it and think about it. What is the reason? Why we are abusing? Why we are human abusing ourselves? not one part of us abusing the other part, but in our nature as human, why we abuse this part to another? Because the real reason of why we have to leave all the violence and the evil, because we don't really want to understand each other. We don't really want to mean it. We don't want to live with individual as an individual we don't want to think for ourselves. We allow these people amply the power to abuse us. And art is a tool to invite everyone to think for themselves, to on their own stand, to be themselves, to have the individual thought. That's why uh, I found all the Roman art and the artists and all the individuals always amuse me, always impress me, uh, always give me uh, inspiration because they are looking for their identity. They are struggling. They are asking questions. Uh, they lost. They are trying to find a way and they are trauma traumatized. They are they hurt, they have the pain inside of them. So this is why they keep thinking by themselves. They keep thinking what the truth. They want to know who they are. They always ask questions. I think the most important part of art 
they make every of us ask questions, ask ourselves who we are and what we are doing. Only we can ask these questions. Only we are not afraid of asking these questions. Only we are not afraid of being lost. We can be human. Thank we you, can... Dania. We have now to close our beautiful panel. I would like to thank you, Simone, for moderating this very interesting panel. Thank you to all the artists who participated this evening and to all the participants of the Biennale. Thank you to the curators, the line, the line Amson, Veronica, and Stephanie, who made this possible. And uh, I would like to end this uh, uh, artist talk with a, with a, um, uh, with uh, with this uh, uh, sentence that vulnerability should not be understood as a subject condition, but as a fundamental feature of our shared and independent life. Good night to everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 And thank you. Yes, yes thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you, Simone. You were great, great, great Thank you, great, great uh, thank you all for thank everything. You. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.